And uh, yeah, thank you to Professor Kretschmann for the invitation to participate today. I've really enjoyed listening to what uh, Chris and Ryan uh, have to say. My work is focused more specifically on um, copyright as such, and I know that the focus of this event is on new technologies in the public interest. So I'll say my work is focused on copyright and the public interest, and uh, more specifically, um, the limits of copyright in the name of the public interest. And so I'm going to be talking about what should really be beyond the reach of copyright protection, both in terms of what goes into um, AI, the trainer training data and inputs, which I'll get to at the end, um, and also what comes out, which is what we've heard a lot about already, these AI generated inputs. So um, that's going to be the focus of, of what I want to say, but I also want to touch a little bit on the sort of principle of technological neutrality as a guiding principle in the law and uh, what that means um, in my mind and uh, how that should help us to inform these um, policy debates around AI generated outputs. So AI is obviously a um, hot topic these days and uh, we hear an awful lot about it. It seems that rather than the sort of AI we were taught to uh, fear in sci-fi movies of our childhood, in fact, artificial intelligence, um, we are told, comes to us as an inventor, as a creator, as opposed to a conqueror. And so, you know, we've heard that machine learning software has made it possible now to effectively generate new works and new things that have all of the external hallmarks of human innovation or in the copyright context, original uh, creative expression. As uh, Anne-Marie Bridie put it back in uh, 2012, we are moving into an era in which machine generated works will be facially indistinguishable from works of human authorship. The machines appear to be creating works of art and music and literature. And um, we typically associate this kind of creativity with human authorship as such. There are lots of go-to examples. We've seen some already. Many of them will be uh, familiar to the audience. We have the AI-generated portrait of Edmund Bellamy, which sold at Christie's auction house for half a million dollars. And we were told that signaled the arrival of AI-generated art on the world auction stage, at least. Um, the art itself, as you can see, uh, the, the portrait was not great. Um, the, the person in the portrait lacked a nose, if we're honest about it. Um, but also we've heard that AI generated art has come on in leaps and bounds even since then. So certainly anyone who's played around with the most recent generation of uh, text to image generators can attest um, to the, the creativity and the sort of impressive aesthetics of this new generation of AI generated works, which are indeed threatening to upset uh, the usual operations of the art world. Um, beyond the visual arts, we have examples in cinema, this uh, sci-fi movie Sunspring, which placed in the top 10 in London's annual film festival, um, back in 2016, um, was written by an AI which called itself Benjamin and which was trained entirely on sci-fi screenplays from the 80s and 90s. The script was surreal and vaguely nonsensical, but nonetheless a movie it was. And there are many more examples that we do encounter increasingly just in our day-to-day um, -day lives. So basic sort of chatbots and machine-generated text um, we have images, um, Google's Deep Dream AI selfies um, here on this slide. We have music, um, as Ryan was telling us about, uh, AI composed music playlists and the style of different artists. And of course, as with any wave of innovative activity, when there's commercial applications and money to be made, the question very quickly becomes, well, who owns this stuff and who gets to make that money? Um, I think a more apt question, or the one that we should begin with, at least, is whether anyone owns it. And in copyright law, that requires us to ask, is it authored? And, and who or what is the author? Um, does it need to be protected? And if so, why? And to what extent? 
Um, so as we've heard um, around the world, um, as things stand, autonomously generated AI works are often in many jurisdictions not considered to be copyrightable works. So in the US, there is this uh, human authorship requirement, which I think is founded in um, pretty solid jurisprudence and also in public policy. And that has meant a sort of steady refusal to um, register works like this one. Um, then we have in Australia, in most of Europe, in, um, in Canada as well, the fact that copyright only attaches to original works of authorship has been taken to mean that they must originate from a human author, a natural person who has a sort of direct intellectual involvement in the resulting expression. Alas, that didn't stop Canada's Copyright Office um, from registering this AI-generated work recently as a work of joint authorship. So it was one with, with one human author and one co-author or joint author that was listed as an AI app. Um, there was not really any good reason for people to jump the gun on this one in the midst of a copyright consultation on this very issue, no less, but we're waiting to see how that will resolve itself. In other jurisdictions, as we've heard, um, there are statutory provisions that deem authorship, so as part of a legal fiction, they're willing to assign authorship to a person who's responsible for making the arrangements that led to the generation of a computer-generated work. So it does seem clear with all of the activity and many of the projects as well that Ryan is leading that we're at this critical moment in the evolution of the law. Um, all around the world, policymakers and lobbyists and corporations and litigants are turning their attention to this question and asking um, whether we should enact a similar statutory provision to ensure the protection of AI generated works and, um, and if we fail to do so, will we necessarily fall behind in this sort of global competition on AI and innovation? And I think then a step back then to the policy that we are very much inclined to think that if something has value, if something is useful and a contribution to our culture or to knowledge or innovation, then it, that should, produce a private entitlement, that somebody should own something. Um, as Rochelle Dreyfus um, put it originally, if, if value then right, seems to be a kind of principled assumption, but it's not a principle that the US Copyright Act embraces. It's not a principle that serves the public interest or the public welfare necessarily. And so we should avoid thinking that just because something is valuable or something is worthwhile, that we have to assign a private right to it. The question we should begin with is whether um, and how copyright should adapt to the rise of AI and whether we need to expand our intellectual property system to what people term catch up with this kind of innovation, um, or whether we're better off thinking about um, the limits of intellectual property and allowing, as I suggest, these works to remain in the public domain. Another kind of principled way to approach this question is to think more broadly about how the law should respond to the emergence of new or paradigm shifting technologies. And one of the terms we're used to thinking about here is that of technological neutrality. So the idea that we should be treating new technologies essentially the way that we have old technologies to maintain a kind of consistency in approach to future proof the law against future technological changes. Um, and so one school of thinking here, what I call formal technological neutrality, tends to think that we should just extend the law to apply to new technologies without any discrimination or differentiation. That if an activity is functionally equivalent in its effect, it produced a work that looks like an artistic work, then we should just treat it in the same way. And so the logic is that if AI generated works are functionally equivalent to human authored works, then we should treat them as such. And if the former would be protected by copyright, then so should be the latter. And I think this is it's just all too easy for us to assume that the law should just be expanding to cover these new innovations by analogy. Right. And it's pretty convenient for those who stand to to gain from that. 
Um, but scholars have repeatedly warned as technologies evolve that with each new game-changing technology, it shouldn't be our, our assumption that the law simply expands. Um, it certainly shouldn't be that the market incumbents or those who stand to benefit economically get to decide how the law reaches into the future. Um, so instead, what I suggest in my work is a more substantive approach to tech neutrality, where we focus on, um, on the public interest, on the normative objectives of the law, and we approach new technologies with normative neutrality. We want to encourage the same public interest, the same public policy goals as technologies change. And so I suggest then in the copyright context, at least, that if our objective in the law is to encourage authorship, to encourage people to engage in creativity and the production of literary and dramatic and artistic works, and to foster this vibrant public domain, then we need to apply copyright now in a manner that consistently advances that purpose. And I suggest that that means requiring human authorship for copyright to vest in a work because copyright is concerned with encouraging authorship and rewarding authors. And I get there by suggesting that AI is not and cannot be an author. So this is a paper that I co-wrote with um, Ian Kerr a few years ago now called The Death of the AI Author. And, uh, and Ian's work in the field of artificial intelligence, unfortunately, we lost him back in 2019. And he had made an enormous contribution um, thinking about artificial intelligence and all kinds of new technologies and how we should understand them with, you know, realistically and relationally and in social context. And so when Ian and I discussed this question about AI authorship and copyright law, his position was that you know, people were kind of misunderstanding what it is that the technology is actually doing when it creates these new works. And I thought that people were misunderstanding what authorship is and what copyright is really supposed to be um, protecting and why. And so what we argued in this paper is that thinking about the AI as an author is making a category mistake. The authors, and AI are different and AI is incapable of authorship. So we don't need to encourage AI creativity. We don't need to reward um, AI generation. Um, so we know, and I'm gonna explain this a little bit more, that um, we know that people are inclined to anthropomorphize robots, right? We're inclined to think about new technologies, AI, robots, as having kind of human attributes and emotions. We heard about how we respond to them talking to us as though they're a person and we build a relationship with them. And this is very common in the cultural sphere. But it's also common amongst AI researchers. So um, there's this paper by Dan Proudfoot where she talks about how the AI researchers will say that Kismet, the robot here, is showing a happy expression or is showing surprise. And of course, she emphasizes it's not doing that at all. It's a representation of a smile or a representation of a gasp. It's not showing anything. It doesn't feel anything. But we use and we talk about it as though there's expression, as though there's expressive agency or intentionality. And there isn't intentionality. It's AI is computational. And so intentions and creativity and expression they're not, and these are just ontologically different things. It seems like obvious to say, but at the same time, we, it's something that bears repeating um, because of our tendency to think of the AI as saying something, as expressing something. We have other examples of um, robots, uh, Spot the dog, robots dancing. And you know people love to watch the robots do the mashed potatoes and we talk about how the robots are dancing. Um, but I'm suggesting to you that the robots are not dancing. The robots are programmed to move, and so they're moving in a certain way. But they're not engaged in dancing because when they move to music, they're not doing anything different than when, you know, you take them into a crowd and let them point their weapons at human subjects. They're just moving the way they're programmed to move. And dancing is an expressive act. Dancing requires you to engage with the music, to try to express yourself, your emotions through movements and music, but robot is not doing that. 
Similarly, when um, when machines neural networks are trained on text and they write something like a screenplay, um, they're simply predicting the words that might be strung logically together into a sentence. It's tempting to read that sentence as though the AI is telling us something, but it's not. It neither knows, understands, nor appreciates the connotations of the word assemblage itself. Ryan Kahlo says the box is gorged on data, but has no taste for meaning. And then I think, you know, more than just humanizing or anthropomorphizing the AI, we tend to romanticize it as well, right? So we start thinking about it as being, as doing something entirely novel and unique, something beyond the reach of humankind. And in doing that, we sort of overlook the vast quantities of human expression and culture that are being used to train the AI. The AI is not, they're not islands, their outputs depend upon all of this human authoring actions, interactions, creative processes, interpretations. But we tend too often to talk about the AI as though it's wholly independent, um, as though it's utterly original. And so I think we're attributing to it again, this kind of creative capacity that it doesn't have to the extent that, you know, the picture I showed at the start, we see this often in one manifestation or the other, we're never quite sure which hand is the hand of God, but in some ways the AI seems to become the ideal author, like the true independent, independent originating entity and the way that we speak about it and romanticize it um, and idealize it is leading us, I suggest, astray in how we make our policy decisions about what we should be doing in response to innovations in this field. AI, again, as I say, is incapable of authorship. It lacks expressive agency. It's not engaged in dialogue. It's not engaged in the creation of cultural meaning. And so my suggestion is that that means that um, even if the works are facially indistinguishable from works of human authorship, um, we should not and we mustn't make the mistake of treating the AI as though it is an author or engaged in authorship, that this is a category mistake. And so that means that, you know, of course, we could just create a legal system that deems authorship in the AI and proceed accordingly. The, the law is perfectly capable of adapting to do that. But if we're thinking about good copyright policy making, we have to begin by recognizing that these works are just fundamentally different in kind and in purpose. And so they fit differently within the copyright scheme. And this point actually extends far beyond copyright law. We'll be making the same kinds of mistakes, misallocating economic and legal resources, privileges, political power, if we apply our laws and we begin our policy debates by misattributing human attributes and intentionality and agency to AI and thereby create economic gain for a few AI owners or creators. Um, so I suggest that we need to exclude AI generated works from copyright protection, leave them in the public domain, not because I don't appreciate it. This one here is a robot that I did not create, um, <laughs> but I did give the text prompt to the AI generator, which also did not actually paint it or create it or express it. But it's a wonderful picture, I think, of a robot painting a picture. Um, and so I see the value in it, but I don't think just because it has value that we have to attach a right to it. I think that we can ensure that copyright works can be freely used, shared in a vibrant public domain, that they can inspire other creators, that they can enrich our culture without being protected by copyright. And um, looking at the time, I'll just take a final minute to say that the same kind of logic can apply when we talk about AI's training inputs, the things that go into training it. Um, the AI is no more a reader than it is an author. It's not an audience member. It's not responding to the works that it is trained on. So I also don't think that um, we could or should treat the AI as um, when it's trained as infringing copyright in the works and the training inputs. Works of authorship, again, are communicative acts. So they are intended to generate and communicate feelings and emotions and responses. A machine is not capable of that when it reads and extracts data 
from um, the kinds of materials that are involved in text and data mining. These things are being used as things. They're not being used as works of expression. They're being scanned to extract data. And so those uses also do not implicate copyright law. So overall, that's, uh, that's my position. This, too, this is a picture of a robot reading a book, which again, I did not create. And my conclusion then is that we need to avoid um, this kind of romanticization um, of robots. And we need to be much more attuned to the social costs of granting copyright control or allowing copyright to intervene in this area. And if we're not honest about what it is we're dealing with and what it is we care about, we're going to make some significant policy uh, mistakes that are going to harm rather than advance the public interest in the age of AI. Thank you very much.